welcome to all of you here tonight uh, for this very promising panel discussion, presentation and discussion on human rights in the MENA region. Um, this is part of our regular uh, Tuesday seminars, that's London Middle East Institute's regular Tuesday slots. But today is special because uh, this is a collaborative event between us at the LMEI and Center for African Studies and SOAS is a school of law. Uh, the, my job is very easy to just give you a very warm welcome and then hand over to my colleague Professor Mashoud Badarin uh, from the School of Law uh, and uh, he will then introduce the speakers and run the session. But I just want to say that the choice of the topic uh, reflects two things, uh, continued and very keen interest in the subject of human rights in our region and I don't think I need to remind everybody here that it's just over eight years since the tumultuous events that rocked the region and really opened up uh, a lot of uh, a scope for a lot of optimism, if not euphoria, about a changing political landscape in which perhaps uh, our governments, our rulers will heed the wishes of the majority and uh, we will perhaps begin the long uh, journey towards a more self uh, representative system of governance. And of course, the last eight years have seen uh, anything but disappointment, um, uh, to, to, to be honest. Uh, but the question as to where we are currently and to wish to take stock of what's happened in the last eight years is never irrelevant. And for that, we have a very uh, powerful, uh, pertinent group of uh, academics and experts on the subject who will be addressing you. So um, the, the, the proceedings are being recorded, but the recording is of the panel and not of the audience, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> uh, we have a legal obligation uh, to uh, make an announcement about this. Uh, and uh, let me uh, welcome you again and uh, encourage you to keep an eye on our regular Tuesday seminars, uh, of which we have another two or so in the remaining weeks of the term uh, in this month. So without further ado, let me ask my colleague, Professor Mashud Badrin, to initiate the proceedings. But just before I do that, uh, I must say that the uh, uh, event tonight really owes uh, it throughout uh, various stages from conception to delivery to the tireless efforts of my colleague Melek Saral, who on this occasion herself is also on the panel. Uh, she's a Marie Curie Fellow at SOAS. She's been he here for us for a year and she has worked tirelessly uh, to uh, put together <coughs> this panel and I'm really grateful to her for this and very pleased that we can also hear her uh, on this very subject. So thank you very much. And Please, Masoud. Yes. Thank you so much, Hassan, for your welcome and also uh, that kind introduction. <coughs> um, my name is Masoud Badrin. I'm a professor of laws at SOAS Law School here. And um, we do have a lot of interest in the MENA regions, also in the School of Law. Uh, tonight, <coughs> we'll be looking at this, I mean, very important subject of human rights in the region, uh, the challenges and opportunities. And I want to add my word to Hassan's words regarding the great effort done by uh, Melek Sarah. Uh, she has been working on the um, challenges and opportunities in the MENA regions, <coughs> particularly Egypt, um, uh, Morocco, and uh, Tunisia. Tunisia. And she has done some field study. Hopefully she will be sharing her experiences with us tonight. Uh, tonight we have three um, experts on, on the uh, subject. Um, the first person to be speaking will be Mishana Husseinun. Uh, Mishana is a lecturer in international relations and Middle East politics in the University of Oxford. And she has done quite I mean, considerable work uh, on this subject. She is the author of The Human Rights Turn and the Paradox of Progress in the Middle East. Uh, her global consultancy, MH Group, specializes in high-profile international legal and diplomatic case files before the United Nations, the African Commission, uh, and uh, Court of Human Rights, and International Criminal Court in The Hague. So both, I mean, academic and, and practice. So we hope to really 
uh, enjoy uh, her contribution this evening. She will be looking at the human rights tone and the paradox of progress in the Middle East. After she speaks, we also have Motaz El Fejre. Motaz is uh, an alum of uh, Suras, uh, doing his PhD here, it's, uh, and he has been really doing a lot of, I mean, active work in that regard. He is the Middle East and North Africa Protection Coordinator for Frontline Defenders and is the Treasurer and Member of the Executive Committee of Euromed Rights. He is the former Executive Director of Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies and Member of its Board of Directors since 2010. He did his PhD here at SWAS, as I said. I was just speaking to him a while ago. He has been shuttling between Ireland and Tunisia, I mean, recent times, uh, doing work in this regard. He will be speaking on regaining the ideals of the Arab Spring, the struggle of human rights defenders in changing political context. And lastly, but not the least, after him, Melek will speak, Melek Sarah. Melek is currently a Marie Curie Research Fellow at SUAS School of Law. Um, I'm working together with her um, on this. Before that, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the URPP, Asia and Europe, University of Zurich. She received a PhD from Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Her current research project on human rights in post-uprisings okay. Middle East, emerging discourses and practices in Egypt and Tunisia, aims at interrogating the human rights discourses and practices in the MENA region, undergoing transition, as uh, uh, Hassan mentioned in his introduction. Her topic will be prospects and challenges of human rights in MENA uh, region since the 2011 Arab uprisings. We have one and a half hours. Uh, what we want to do is each of the speakers will speak just for 15 minutes. And please be on time, because I will really want to, because we want to have discussions and questions. So 15 minutes, and after that, Perhaps we'll have interview, we'll take interventions and possible questions and answers in this series. So without much ado, I will call on Minshana to do our presentation. 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Professor. Is the mic on? Okay, great. Yes, it's on. <clears throat> Thank you very much to SOAS and to all the panelists um, for you know including me on this important discussion. And thanks above all to you for being here for it and hopefully participating in the most important part, which is, as you correctly said, the exchange that's to take place afterwards. Um, this sort of serves as a informal belated launch um, for my book that I published last year, The Human Rights Turn and the Paradox of Progress in the Middle East, an embarrassingly long title. Um, and also, I have to admit, I suffer from eternal optimism. So if the picture that I paint of the region is rosier than the actual reality, I, I, I do apologize for that. But I feel like I have to compensate for the negativity, uh, especially after the Arab Spring. But I refuse. I refuse to give in to that. I, I remain hopeful. And I will tell you why you can be just as hopeful as I am. Because it's not a matter of wishful thinking, but actually uh, very kind of close study of the patterns in the region uh, through time and across space that lead me to that conclusion and give me the faith that I have today standing before you uh, to sharing my kind of prognosis for, for the potential and the prospect for, uh, for kind of human rights realization in the region and not just there but everywhere. So Let's see, where should we begin? Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that the United Nations, um, in signing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, set a sort of common uh, standard for kind of um, fundamental human rights across the globe. And at that time, um, it was agreed upon universally um, that there are basic human rights that apply to all. We should not open that debate up once again. This uh, cultural relativism trap that we fall into has us questioning the universality. All you have to do is remember the events of Tahrir Square. Remember the green movement in Iran for you know, to be reminded of the universal sort of uh, desire and 
universal trend uh, that is trending towards um, a demand for freedom, dignity, and basic human rights. And I think that amid the sort of history of uh, repression in the region, and let's not make light of that, of course, uh, there has been a sort of general arc towards progress. But I will submit that this uh, trajectory has not been linear, okay? So progress, and this is the thesis of my book, does not take place in a linear fashion. It is, uh, you know, rife with uh, disappointment and, um, and pain and suffering and, and blood and tears. And that is part of the story of progress. It is uh, something that we have to accept, unfortunately, that progress doesn't happen in a straightforward fashion, but that it will uh, be marked with uh, regression. However, if we take a long-range view, as I'm suggesting we do, we start to see a new narrative emerge. And this is the narrative that I would like to inaugurate about the region, that amid all of the repression, all of the regression on rights, there has been a parallel story of hope, of progress, and of that universal yearning for the realization of fundamental human rights. And unfortunately, it has sometimes taken um, dramatic sort of uh, reversals in that trend for there to be another progressive moment, an opening where people come and demand forcefully from their leaders that their rights be uh, respected. Uh, we saw this in, in many occasions in historical revolutions, unfinished revolutions, I would call them, because the cumulative effects of those revolutions are felt uh, into the future. And the Arab Spring, if we can call it that for, you know, um, for the sake of uh, just sort of theorizing, I know it's been debated whether we can even call it a spring if it's turned into a winter, but the Arab Spring was not an overnight phenomenon. If you go back, it's part of the sort of snowball effects of many revolutions past and many sort of civil society movements that have since been sort of stifled. However, you cannot fundamentally repress that energy and it keeps rising to the surface over and over again. And anyone who tells me that that has gone away and just because we can't see it, I will have them, uh, I will have them know that, that this is sort of a recurring trend in the way that um, as I mentioned, the Green Movement in Iran is the continuation of an unfinished revolution in 78, 79, uh, which was since sort of co-opted, but is now kind of came back to reassert itself. And then again, uh, about a year, over a year ago, when you had a new round of protests, people demanding more forcefully and more courageously for their rights. So the Arab Spring, uh, and in the sort of the different movements in the public squ squares around the region, you were able to sort of sense the individual kind of national uh, struggles. But at the same time, there was an overlapping of, of struggles and a sudden awareness of the, the common struggle across the region, not just the region, I would say it's um, part of the sort of international rights movement um, that has been going on for, for decades. So it's, it's picked up momentum in cases like that in, in sort of progressive openings. It has since been quashed, uh, as we all know, but it is bound to come back to the surface in different forms. And that's something we shouldn't ever kind of try to predict. It's going to take on whatever organic form it does. Um, at the same time, you have the regimes across the region taking note of this revolution of rising expectations, and they're adapting their policies uh, to the changing times and to these demands. Because the greater gap there is between the sort of pledges of the regimes and the promises and their actual delivery on these promises, the greater credibility and legitimacy gap ensues, and the greater need there is to close that gap. Otherwise, regimes go the way of you know, uh, Mubarak and, and others, if they cannot meet these demands. 
from the people, from below. So there's a combination of these bottom-up forces, so this revolution from below, but also the top-down forces that are, in a sense, now anticipating the public disgruntlement and trying, in many cases, to preempt it. Uh, so we see a host of reforms, sort of controlled reforms, you know, in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere that are providing what I call rights cushions. But this indicates this awareness on the part of the different regimes across the region of their human rights imperative. So you would say, why is it even necessary for them to do that? Are they just paying lip service to sort of rights, uh, you know, the, the, the rights uh, demands? In reality, um, they are acknowledging the importance of legitimacy, of the, the dual sort of soft and hard power, and also increasingly the international scrutiny that they're receiving, uh, the membership on the Human Rights Council, the fact that they're having to answer not just to their domestic constituency, but to the international community. The fact that everything is being uh, broadcast online and on television, all of that is pushing uh, governments towards the realization of rights, whether they like it or not, whether they realize it or not. But it's happening. Again, not in a linear fashion, and oftentimes through great difficulty. But my argument is that not that um, progress is not just happening in spite of the extent of the regression and repression, but thanks to it. So I see challenge as the opportunity. Challenge as opportunity. Um, so think about that a little bit. I will uh, pass on the sort of uh, the mic to my friends, and um, I look forward to engaging with you later in a, in a discussion about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alvin Shah, for keeping to time. Thank you so much. Thanks. So we'll move on to uh, Mutaz. Good evening, and thanks a lot for the organizer. And I'm very honored to be here in, <clears throat> in my place and my home. I spent uh, more than six years here in, at SOAS and was very insightful in my, in my life. Uh, well, um, I, w I want to be far in my analysis from my uh, colleague, um, despite the fact is that we receive every day very... Uh, miserable stories and dramatic stories on the situation and the figures are very worrying when it comes to humanitarian situation, humanitarian conditions in the region, but, but there are also some uh, reasons to be um, uh, optimistic on, on, on the future and especially on the resistance that we have been seeing and uh, experiencing in the region. Uh, but let me begin first by explaining, I mean, why this dramatic situation when it comes to human rights? What happened over the past few years that made uh, uh, human rights in this region are systematically under, under attack? Uh, I mean, the first, the first factor, which I think clear to all of us, is that the revolutions, or if we call it uprising revolution or Arab Spring, is, has been under uh, under attack from counter-revolutionary, I, I, I will call it counter-revolutionary uh, alliances in the region. Uh, regionally, there is, of course, growing dynamics, uh, growing actors, uh, most particularly, I mean, I would say Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, and the rules in, in many countries in the region, uh, regional interference in domestic politics in Egypt, uh, what happened in, in July 2013 uh, can be seen from this uh, framework. Uh, also in, in Yemen, in Libya, uh, this regional dynamics, uh, polarization between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, growing rule of Qatar and Turkey, had uh, implication uh, uh, over the trajectories that have been taken uh, by uh, Arab uh, political regime since 2011. Uh, also international uh, behavior, international actors' behavior. Today in the region, uh, taking example of Egypt, my, my home country, Egypt is one of the big uh, recipient of arms, uh, weapons from European 
government, uh, despite the fact that it's under a military dictatorship since 2013. More and more systematic violation of human rights and the crimes have been committed every day. Just this month, uh, 15 persons uh, executed uh, following uh, politically motivated trials, unfair trials. And we saw our uh, European leaders were in Egypt uh, taking photos with President Sisi on the margin of the uh, Europe-Arab summit. <coughs> Uh, so this behavior also in, in Saudi Arabia, the UK uh, support to Saudi Arabia, uh, France uh, military support to Saudi Arabia, which also have been used uh, against civilians in Yemen. Uh, so this behavior has been uh, known in the region since a long time, before 2011. And today, uh, most Western government prefer to have a strong men in the region, on the assumption that this will protect uh, their borders from illegal migrants, from uh, flow of refugees, and also to gain collaboration on counter-terrorism and so on. But of course, get, getting more closer to the root causes of terrorism and radicalization are not, of course, to be separate from the poor condition of human rights and socioeconomic condition in the region. But usually, Western government have had very short-sighted policies when coming to this region, to the Middle East and North Africa. Um, Another reason also, which is very structural, uh, and I think it's, it can be, it can back to colonial era, there are structural um, limitation in the state uh, and nation building in many countries in the region, I mean Libya, and Yemen, Syria, and uh, that's why following 2011, many of the intractable social uh, complexities came into surface. For years, some dictators managed to contain this contradiction. But following the fall of this dictator, or when these countries uh, faced uh, 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 significant internal uh, uh, changes, we, we saw these complexities uh, uh, came into, into surface. I think Libya is a great and, and a clear example of that, and Yemen as well. And this actually challenges the idea that uh, uh, a strong leader can achieve stability in this, in this, because it's a very fragile stability. Once those leader uh, disappear or there is a split in the regime, we saw, I mean, that, uh, I mean, the situation become very difficult to manage and to uh, uh, control. Um, another reason also, um, I mean, for, for this kind of, of challenges is uh, sectarian polarization. Uh, and which is very structural also in many countries in the region. Polarization along the religion is one factor. Uh, liberal, secularist, I mean, th this is what was one of the factors of the failure of the Egyptian uh, revolution. I mean, the polarization between liberal leftists and Islamists. Uh, another factor is also tribal polarization in Libya or sectarian polarization in Iraq or Syria uh, or in Yemen as well. This also uh, undermined the political movement toward democracy in this region. But there is ongoing resistance that, that, you know, less covered in international media. Because in international media and international debates, we focus on the failure of Arab Spring. We focus on the crackdown on human rights defenders and those people who fight for human rights in the region, who pay a high price today. But there are ongoing resistance. And, and I will focus on that in my, uh, uh, in my intervention, because being in the region, traveling in the region, working from Tunisia, I uh, closely uh, observe this uh, this resistance. Uh, one one of the uh, of the major uh, issues that mobilize people today in the region is the socio-economic uh, demand. I think in one year, 2018, we saw in Jordan, in June, people took to the street against austerity, austerity measures. In Iran, we have seen that uh, 2017, 2018. In Basra, in Iraq, uh, it has uh, some uh, sectarian reason, but also economic uh, reason. Today, in Mor in Algeria and Sudan cannot be also isolated from the socio-economic conditions in Morocco, in certain region in Morocco. And this socio-economic conditions also is interlinked with the uh, um, reduction of oil prices in the region. Uh, so it has become very much difficult for some government like Algeria or uh, uh, other countries that uh, depend on, 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 on Gulf support 
to uh, 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 subsidies, you know, subsidize uh, 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 commodities or to buy loyalties in, in certain countries. So that's why there are more and more young people who are uh, uh, marginalized and more and more marginalized community try to uh, express their, their demand. Uh, but this is something that mobilize people today. Uh, just one example uh, to, to get closer to this struggle, Morocco, there is a, a movement uh, called a major movement. It's an, a marginalized region in, in, in Morocco. Um, this movement composed of mainly from marginalized Amazigi uh, uh, ethnic minority, it fight against environmental exploitation and economic exploitation by business owned by the royal family in Morocco. And they organize themselves very well over the past few years, but there is no attention to this to this fight. And people taken to jail and uh, physically attacked, and, but they continue. And mainly the, the, uh, the fighters in this movement are from young people. We cannot, you know, overlook the demographic reality in the region, which make it very hard for a political uh, ruler to control their societies because more than 50% of this society are young, from young generation, and they are uh, more, uh, they are marginalized economically, and they have expectation, political expectation following uh, 2011 uprising. Another uh, 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 resistance we, we, we also uh, witness in the region, the, the LGBT movement, uh, for example, in the Middle East. And this is very much interconnected with what we can call surge in, in right demand since 2011. And this is one of the achievements of the Arab Spring, that people continue to claim right, LGBT community in Tunis, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Morocco. For the first time in Egypt, I mean, the rainbow flag raised in one of the public uh, event in Cairo. I, I couldn't imagine that to happen in, in Egypt. Uh, Tunis, the first LGBT association, Shams Association, was established. Uh, and, and also another, another, another uh, uh, marginalized, I mean, or other marginalized community like ethnic minorities, Nubian in Egypt. Now they are very active in demanding their right. Uh, when it comes to gender equality, today the, the debate is very uh, 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 active in, in Tunisia on inheritance, equality in inheritance. And you know, in Muslim countries, these issues are very uh, 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 divided, you know, and uh, uh, controversial. But today, even the president of Tunisia sponsor a law that provides inheritance inequality between men and women. Uh, um, so this resistance, why this resistance uh, is, is ongoing and why it will it will uh, develop over the coming period? We, we spoke about the demographic reality, the socioeconomic condition, and also the role of human rights movement inside and outside uh, the region. And I think the human rights movement was able to uh, show resilience. In a country like Egypt, despite the fact that there is intense crackdown on human rights defenders since 2014, there is a distribution of work between activists inside, outside the country, collaboration between domestic uh, worker and international human rights organization to expose and to publish news on, on, and figures on uh, crimes that are committed. When Sisi visited the United States uh, to meet Trump, his first visit, Washington Post, New York Times just published the figures uh, uh, conveyed by local uh, groups uh, inside Egypt on extrajudicial uh, killing, on, on forced disappearance, and so on, using also uh, strategic litigation internationally and regionally. And this is very important. We can, uh, I mean, remember the rule of human rights movement in Chile or Brazil under, under military dictator and how this movement played a very important role in raising the human rights issues uh, globally and undermining the military regime at that time. Uh, but what are the limitations today for human rights activism and can this lead to significant change or not? While I'm very optimistic on the long term of this kind of, of struggle and, and resistance, there are also some, some risk and limitations. The first limitation, I think, is the division societal division that is very intense in many countries today in the region, across religion, across sectarian, sectarianism and uh, uh, tribal uh, affi affiliations. This is one of the, of the challenges that, uh, uh, that um, somehow obstruct the work of human rights activists. Another, another limitation is um, the political, the vacuum or the weakness of the political organizations that can negotiate with repressive regime. I mean, Protesters can create noisy, can create, you know, some kind of, of, of mobilization. But when it comes to negotiation with military repressive regime or with spoilers, usually this is what happened in 2011, the revolution were undermined because there was no political movement to 
uh, take up the, the challenge and to negotiate with dictatorial uh, regime. The, as, uh, another factor also is the regional dynamics. And this is something that will continue in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, the role of, 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 you know, of, of regional powers that are able to intervene in, in, in internally in these countries and are able also to control certain uh, political, political group. And finally, the security vacuum, because, and I think we see that today in Tunis, uh, the transition in Tunis is one positive thing, but at the same time, it doesn't have the capacity in terms of security to control the threat, security threat that are uh, 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 coming from different uh, uh, neighbors in, in Tunisia. Uh, and I think this also putting more and more uh, pressure on, on, on democratic transition. I will conclude, conclude here and I will be ready to engage with your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Motaz, also for being within time. So we'll quickly go on to Malik. Thank you very much uh, for joining us to, uh, this evening, and thank you uh, also uh, Hassan uh, ha uh, and Mashoud for supporting uh, this uh, event. Um, <coughs> I mean, I would actually support uh, uh, two panelists, but may my um, uh, talk might, uh, might be a little bit uh, more pessimistic <laughs> than uh, the others. So, uh, as Mashhud um, uh, told you in the introduction, uh, this is actually based on my research, which looks at uh, two uh, to three uh, uprising countries, Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco. I will focus uh, this evening uh, on <coughs> Tunisia and Egypt. And uh, I will give you some insights based on the evidence uh, from... Um, from the semi-structured interviews I conducted uh, during uh, 2017 and 2018 uh, in Tunisia and uh, Istanbul and in London. So popular uprisings uh, did not only change the existing authoritarian regimes, it uh, raised also the hopes that the human rights situation in uh, the North African countries, in the MENA region, will improve. So after eight years, uh, we have uh, different cases, uh, such as Tunisia, which is labeled mostly as uh, one of the race success stories uh, in the region, and Egypt, uh, which uh, turned out to be a, an, uh, another authoritarian regime after the coup in 2013. So uh, Tunisia's uh, success is mostly explained uh, by it is, you know, homogeneous uh, population and also demographics and also strong civil society and uh, uh, stable institutions. And actually, when we look uh, at the transitional process, we see uh, uh, the, uh, that Tunisia actually could make use of the opportunities, opportunities and uh, establish some uh, very important uh, institutions which are, uh, which are um, vital for the protection of human rights. When we look at uh, the uh, constitution-making process, for instance, we see that uh, very diverse political actors uh, could uh, reach a consensus and uh, put together a constitution uh, which uh, was a, a compromise between the Islamists and secularists, which was not actually uh, possible in Egypt. And we see also that a, a transitional justice process took place uh, in Egypt uh, through the Dignity Commission uh, although it was at the end not really successful, successful because it is ma mandate was not uh, extended uh, by the parliament in Tunisia. But uh, we can say that the uh, process was marked uh, by the constant search uh, by all parties for consensus. When I interviewed uh, Rashid Khanoushi, he told me the magic formula for uh, the success of Tunisian story is the consensus. We have, uh, I quote him, we have discovered that in periods of transition, what you need is not a simple major majoritarian democracy, but a consensus based on democracy, where you take everyone with you, informing the constitution 
position in shaping the future of the country. And Nahda has given a lot of concessions to avoid this pol polarization, including on the issue of Sharia. The mentioning of Sharia in the Constitution was one of the things that could have divided our society. That is why we decided to leave it out of the Constitution. So, However, uh, after eight years, uh, many civil society actors, also oppositional, uh, the political actors from the oppositional parties, uh, expressed their concerns that there is a backlash uh, with regard to human rights in the country. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the country, Tunisia, is uh, facing uh, many challenges. So security uh, issues, for instance, economic uh, deficit, uh, to support some very important constitutional uh, uh, institutions uh, and the constitutional court uh, hasn't been established yet uh, uh, but uh, the strongest concern was actually uh, the uh, return of the old faces, old uh, politicians uh, from the Ben Ali area again uh, to the political system. So, uh, and uh, this was actually uh, expressed by many political actors, uh, for instance, uh, from, uh, Shafiq Ayadi from the TACO, uh, but also uh, many of the civil society uh, actors uh, mentioned this, that the uh, period of after the 2014 uh, was actually just a struggle to keep the rights which was uh, actually gained during the first uh, period. So um, during the uh, period uh, when uh, the Asabsi um, uh, government was ruling after the 2014, actually many uh, positive uh, steps uh, have been taken like uh, particularly with regard to women's rights. Uh, for instance, uh, women were not allowed uh, to marry a non-Muslim. This was lifted, this, uh, uh, this uh, law. And, but uh, these steps were also uh, criticized uh, because uh, these steps were mainly taken when uh, there were uh, debates about the reconciliation bill, which was a, again a really uh, backlash with regard to human rights, was regarded uh, so because uh, it was uh, um, it was uh, giving an amnesty to the officials uh, from Ben Ali area, which were involved in corruption cases, provided they repaid the uh, stolen money back. So this was uh, actually this bill was defended by the um, Nida Tunis and Nahda members as a necessary tool to make the country again uh, work in uh, in economic terms, but uh, it uh, damaged the transitional justice uh, process. Um, However, uh, the main gain was, and it was also uh, supported by political actors and civil uh, society actors, uh, that uh, the key, uh, key gain during this transitional justice is the huge popularity of human rights. So everybody is speaking about human rights, which, which was not the case. Um, before the uprisings, and uh, this is also the uh, the same uh, in case of Egypt, actually. So when I was uh, interviewing the people from Egypt, uh, uh, I was so frustrated, actually. Uh, it was a hard case for me, Egypt, uh, to analyze. So uh, because I mainly uh, interviewed the uh, victims of um, human rights violations. So actually, but the, they were the ones who gave me hope. <laughs> So they told me the important thing here is uh, that we are struggling. We are speaking about human rights. Everybody, uh, the uh, awareness about human rights, awareness of human rights is so high in Egypt now. It was never the case. Because the violations are so uh, high and affect everybody, uh, in turn, everybody is speaking about their rights. I mean, everybody, if they are even not really uh, brave enough to demand it because uh, the station uh, does not really allow it uh, always, but they are aware of their rights and they are speaking about it. And this is the most important thing in Egypt. But in Egypt, uh, we can say uh, the uh, biggest challenge uh, before the coup was the inexperience of the politi uh, politicians uh, with regard to 
governing, actually. I mean, Muslim Brotherhood maybe was uh, good in delivering some services, uh, you know, to the uh, um, uh, to the Egyptians, but uh, when uh, they uh, were supposed to go, go in the country, they were inexperienced, and uh, the ex-ministers or politicians uh, from uh, uh, Egypt uh, also uh, mentioned this, uh, in, uh, criticizing themselves that they were actually inexperienced and many of the failures were, were actually because of this inexperience. And they were also not really concerned about human rights. So uh, when I interviewed the, uh, one member of the National Human Rights uh, Council, for instance, he told me he really uh, tried very hard uh, to take the model of Tunisia and to put uh, uh, in process this transitional justice, like in uh, uh, in uh, Tunisia, but uh, he was told that is a really big issue beyond the abilities of Egypt. So the readiness and willingness uh, to put these institutions uh, uh, to protect human rights uh, was not really in Egypt. And after the coup uh, in 2013, uh, I would say actually we see uh, that the uh, human rights violations are institutionalized. So the institutions uh, which are supposed to actually uh, protect human rights are the ones uh, which violate human rights. So uh, a report from the UN uh, Committee Against Torture in 2017 says actually the prosecutors, judiciary, are supporting and uh, enabling the tortures in uh, Egypt. So it is a systemized uh, violations of what, uh, what we actually uh, now experience in Egypt. It is the um, and it's so widespread. Even uh, when you, I mean, in practice, even if you try to report uh, human rights violations, you can be uh, a victim of uh, the regime. So regime is actually just trying uh, to create a fear. Uh, through violating human rights uh, that, uh, and to, to stop this uh, demand for human rights. But as I said, uh, even the uh, victims of human rights have high hopes uh, so that uh, the struggle is still there and the uh, awareness for human rights is really much higher than prior to human rights. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all so much, I mean, uh, Melek and um, all the panelists uh, for keeping within time. So we are working, I mean, within time. Uh, before we um, take questions, Hassan, I mean, do you want to um, say something? I, it's been very interesting and very thought-provoking, but I don't want to abuse my position, though. Okay. I do have questions and comments. Okay. But in all humility, I, I really also want to... Yes. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Definitely. I will also not abuse my position. Um, I will throw the floor open now. Uh, just identify yourself briefly and please ask a question. If you want to intervene, indicate that it's an intervention rather than a question so that I mean, you can then summarize what you want to say. But if it's a question, please be brief. So the floor is open now. You might indicate who you want to answer, or maybe it could be general, and any of the panelists could answer it. Questions? Interventions? Yes. Hello, my name's Arvin. Uh, I'm a year of politics and I'm actually here at SARS. Um, I just wanted to know how much does the panel think the politicization of human rights has affected its movement in the Middle East? What I mean is, um, so like the movement's been co-opted by Western governments to, uh, to sort of push the you know, like Iranian government, the Syrian government in certain directions. And, and ha yeah, so has that ended the movement? Thank you very much. I mean, that's a very good question. Politicization of human rights. I mean, we discuss this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, who wants to have the first go? Okay. I definitely agree that the instrumentalization of human rights um, has been very problematic, especially when it's used as a tool for intervention in the region, whether it's the sort of liberating missions, Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, importing democracy, those are all 
uh, against the spirit of human rights. And it also, unfortunately, provides the regimes in the region with <coughs> a way to kind of reject human rights on ground of it being about Western imperialism. However, that's the sort of cultural relativism trap I was discussing earlier. Um, it still does not ex ex excuse the local regimes from their duties, their responsibilities uh, towards their people. Um, of course, it's also giving human rights a bad name when it comes um, in the form of a military intervention. Yes, I, I, I think is one of the challenges. But I think this is something uh, we can see even in Western societies. How, where are you from political power? Define your discourse in human rights. In Egypt, uh, you can see the same people, for example, who struggled against Muslim Brotherhood when they were in power for human rights. They are the same people who violated human rights once they are closer to power and even justified the killing of protesters, you know, in Rabaa in 2013. So you can see, even in Tunisia, the debate on inheritance, sometimes, you know, it is used, it is, of course, a great goal, and we, uh, personally, I, I support that, but it also sometimes it's used by certain people to support and advance political agenda without being, you know, heartedly, heart, you know, defending the, the, the rights. So it's something really uh, uh, common in the region, but I, I think it is also in Western uh, societies you can, you can find it. I just would like to add, for instance, in case of Tunisia, we see actually uh, when Ben Ali come to power, uh, he said he is there because of the human rights violations. So actually, uh, human rights uh, are uh, used also. I mean, I would divide here, uh, separate here. Actually, internal maybe politicization and external politicization. And we, when we look to the internal politicization, many of the politicians, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the cases I analyze at least, uh, use the um, uh, human rights discourses as a legitimizing tool. Actually, even if they uh, didn't mean uh, to protect human rights, as I said, for instance, Ben Ali said. Uh, I, I, I am here just because of the several human rights violations. And we see also during, for instance, CAF uh, uh, ruling, uh, if you just look at the um, speeches uh, provided by, by SCAF, uh, you will see that they also uh, uh, express that, uh, their interest for protection of human rights, which was actually not in practice the case. So it is mostly actually internally used by the political actors, this politicization, uh, to leg legitimize their acts or their uh, positions. Oh, well, let me flip the coin. I'm not abusing my position, but I mean, <laughs> the, I want to flip the coin. I mean, in relation to politicizing, I mean, human rights, it's not only on the sides of governments. It's not. Um, I want to pass maybe... Uh, if you look at many African countries, I'm not talking I mean, Africa, mm -hmm. uh, sub-Saharan African countries, I mean, you find out that at one point in time, human rights activists were only acting as revolutionaries against military regimes. They, I mean, they were just using human rights mm -hmm. against military regimes. They were not very organized. And when the military regimes were toppled, you found that they couldn't deliver anything because they were just using human rights as a tool of, I mean, of ch regime change. And eventually, I mean, through practices, you find out that the human rights organization in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of West Africa particularly, have really, I mean, moved on properly now, well organized. And they know the times when they can work with government to achieve their aims, they know it. The time when they can challenge government to achieve their aims, they know it. They, they get the point. So I don't know whether such identification has been realized in MENA regions in relation to human rights organizations, mm -hmm. human rights activists, mm -hmm. rather than states. You know, politicization of human rights itself by activists. Do you want to talk to that? Particularly? Yes, I, I, I totally agree because this is one of the limitations that, that I raised. Yes, there are now surge in demand and human rights demand, but when it comes to politics, when it comes to organization, some of those actors who defend human rights when, when they are sitting on table for negotiation, mm -hmm. They don't deliver or they are not able to convey a unified message to negotiate yeah. with the repressive regime. This happened in Egypt 2011, and it is one of the limitations that meet Tunisian transition today also. So uh, mobilization of protesters, mobilization of society is one thing. Yeah. But to rule exactly. and to be able to deliver is another thing. Exactly. It's, exactly. it's two different issues. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Hiram. I'm a student 
Institute and for the Institute of Development Forces SOAS. So, first of all, I thank the panelists for the very important presentation they all provided, and also for trying to provide kind of like an optimistic view, because we might need that right now. However, um, just I'd like to comment on that. Um, one thing that I noticed that it's common in the three presentations on which optimism is built upon is like kind of people who start to recognize that they have certain rights and start like reporting um, like some cases um, and think that they should be able to express their rights better. But like thinking of the Egyptian context in specific, um, I see as much as that is right, that a lot of other cases go unreported. Um, and also, not everyone has got the leverage to express themselves. Um, and especially the incident of the LGBT, people trying to uh, raise the flag, actually the consequence for this was very harsh and people got in prison for this. So it's good to see people reporting and recognizing their rights, but what happens on the other side, what are the responses? Uh, the policies. Is there a policy change for that? Um, people now are not allowed to protest, to go to the street, to raise any kind of like written stuff, express themselves in any way. Um, <coughs> many other cases that go unreported or like like very harsh responses for those uh, incidents happen. So, how does that fit? Like, is it is it enough to be a Optimistic, just because people are starting to recognize their rights and try to express themselves, or do we still need more? Thank you. You know, if we fixate on the daily human rights violations, of course, it's a bleak, completely bleak picture. But I'm suggesting that we expand our lens a little bit to look at the history, the trajectory, and to also recognize that rights progress is not just about um, the sort of diminishment of those violations, but also about the change that's taking place in the sort of social, cultural fabric. For instance, it's the rich sort of um, history of judicial activism in Egypt. That's something you can't take away, sort of the activist judges, the legacy of the Supreme Constitutional Court holding the executive to account. Those are things that are also representing a lot of progress in the realm of human rights, but that we don't normally notice because oftentimes we take it for granted and oftentimes they're eclipsed by all of the rights violations. So we have to take all those different pieces uh, together and then we get a new picture of what progress looks like. It may not be, it's not a one size fits all thing. It's not an all or nothing. And for, for certain, it's not a sort of Western liberal kind of concept of progress. Just because we don't have fully fledged democracies, functional democracies in the region, doesn't mean that the region has not attained a level of liberal uh, kind of uh, development. Yeah. So. Yep. After you? Please, no. no. I mean, because you raised this question of risk and the threat on human rights defenders, because my work at Frontline is to work with human rights defenders to meet this risk. You know, I've been in this field since 2003. You cannot work in human rights in this region or in any repressive context without having some price. There are price, there are costs, and there are risk. But there are tactics and strategies. Some people uh, may confront the high risk and, you know, like those people who raise uh, Rimpo in, in, in Egypt or some LGBT activists also in Tunisia who come publicly and they received also death threat and physical violence. But there are also other tactics, you, you know, and you see today in Egypt, when I, when I talk about the resilience of human rights movements, the survival of human rights movement, you work low profile, you try to distribute work between domestic and external factor, uh, actors, you work with, you collaborate with international organizations to convey messages. So it depends how you strategize for, uh, for your work. But, you know, young people, Young protesters, grassroots activists, they tend today to take more risk. You see that, you see this today in Algeria, in Sudan, and in certain regions in Egypt also. The constitutional amendment uh, President Sisi now proposed to rule until 2034. A lot of young people now record two or three minutes on Twitter and social media to oppose the, the, the constitutional amendment. President Sisi will not be able to arrest all of those people, there are thousands of people, you know. He arrests, of course, some people, but then they, more people come, more people appear. So repression also has limits, you know. When, it, when repressive regime confronted with a huge number of protesters and a huge number of uh, activists and wide wave of protest. Thank you.
And I just want to say this is a process, so it is not the end now. Yes. So, okay, today we have really several human rights violations in some of the countries like Egypt. But uh, people, even, I mean, the Egyptians have uh, these hopes because they, are, uh, they just think this is, the, this is not the end and it will change. For instance, uh, many of the uh, Egyptians are working in human rights NGOs based, at, uh, based in different countries told me what uh, are they trying now is actually just to document these human rights violations because they are, don't have any hope that they will ha have this support from the international community, which is lacking so far. But they just uh, have the hope it, the situation will change. When it changes, then they need these documents about human rights violations. One of the uh, ex-parliament uh, uh, member told me, for instance, the uh, problem with the Sadat area, wa area was uh, that they didn't have these documents uh, document uh, to the human rights violations, and because of this, they couldn't bring this uh, into the justice. Uh, so they try now hard uh, to document to, uh, every single human rights violations, and once the situation is changed, they hope for justice. So the hope is there because it's a process. Now the station is not good, but the, uh, people are just working on it to change it. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Jessica Brown. I'm a master's student in international development at LSE. And um, I wanted to ask more specifically for expansion on um, women's rights. I know, Mutaz, you touched on this um, briefly, but for all of the panelists. Um, and especially curious about the case of Egypt, where you do have human rights violations, but then also kind of some lip service towards women's rights and kind of what the what that actually looks like. And do we have a reason for optimism about women's rights in Egypt or in the region as a whole? Women's rights, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so women's rights, I would say uh, it was so different uh, for me in uh, these three cases I investigated, actually. Uh, I mean, Tunisia had a you know, more secular uh, legal framework also prior to the uprising. So uh, to discuss some of the rights, even to discuss LGBT rights, uh, uh, is much easier in Tunisia than uh, compared to other countries. So we see then in Tunisia, uh, uh, you know, these uh, laws, for instance, um, uh, about uh, marrying a non-Muslim, uh, even they are heavily discussing now the inheritance law. Uh, but uh, I don't know uh, if the reason in Egypt uh, was uh, that they were not uh, willing to discuss it, but they have uh, more pre uh, pressuring issues. So uh, I, I would say, for instance, <coughs> if I ask uh, people uh, about uh, human rights in Tunisia, they mostly just uh, start to speak about freedom of expression. So they have this luxus. But if I uh, ask Egyptians about human rights, they speak about torture about arbitrary detentions. That, so the you know, uh, issues are the, the so different, they didn't have time to speak about women's rights. If the transition process was different, they might speak about it. We don't know, so I can just speculate. So, but uh, in Tunisia, it is r really progressed, uh, I would say, with regard to human rights. Maybe briefly also a positive uh, factor also over the past eight years is a growing rule of women and women human rights defenders in the region. Mm -hmm. In Saudi Arabia, you see now uh, Mohammed bin Salman, I mean, put them in jail because they are effective. The campaign that they have uh, uh, convened uh, in, in Kuwait, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Bahrain, uh, a woman like Ibsam al-Sa'iq, she is a leading civil and political activist who was arrested for sexual harassment in Egypt, in Algeria today, and Sudan. Look to the role of women activists mm -hmm. in the Sudanese protest. But of course, the threats that they face are very specific, and they are more and more vulnerable, and sexual harassment and sexual violence is something used in Egypt also uh, uh, under all regimes since 2011. Mm -hmm. It has been used as a weapon against uh, uh, women activists. The lifting of the driving ban in Saudi Arabia is very significant, not because women finally have the right to drive, but because it will open the floodgates to a whole host of other rights demands. And they were sort of delaying that 
but they were de delaying the inevitable, and that was something that was bound to happen. And now that women uh, have claimed that right, they are also bound to claim many more. And this is also going to the point on uh, people taking more risks. And women are, in particular are taking a lot more risks. That means that this is the end of a culture of impunity and fear. So when fear uh, lifts, then anything is possible. And the fear is actually more felt on the part of the regimes than the people. And the increasing kind of like aggressive tactics that are used by the regime the different regimes only attest to the insecurity that they feel vis-a-vis -vis the popular demands. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Yara. I study here in South undergrad, Middle East, and, and development. And I just quickly wanted to touch on um, your statement. Don't you think, though, that it matters that why Saudi Arabia is doing it? I would, I mean, yes. please, Mohammed bin Salman is more doing it to be internationally accepted, probably. Let him do it. It's wonderful. And he doesn't have to do it. So it's, it's actually, it shows that even the Saudi Arabias of the world are having to adjust themselves and adapt to the changing expectations. Um, they could be doing it for a variety of reasons, and that's fine. And oftentimes, it's done for instrumental reasons. However, um, the sort of spiral model of norm socialization would would sort of argue that that is the first step towards the actual internalization of those norms. And the bottom line is that women had a hand in that. And were it not for the bravery of the people who did risk their lives and livelihoods to kind of um, challenge those strict laws, those changes may have never taken place. Yeah. My question also relates to women's rights, and it is um, how can we in the West, as part of a transnational feminist movement, extend our solidarity to the struggle for women's rights in the region, without, uh, like, while at the same time rejecting Orientalist assumptions that deprive these women of agency and sort of reduce them to a homogenous group or identity. Yeah. I think uh, uh, one positive thing today is that the level of um, solidarity and support to women human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia, as an example, is growing. Uh, we see it in international media, how even British media you know, have become very interested in that. Look at the debate today in, in United Kingdom, France, Germany on military export to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and how it, be, uh, 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 how, how it can be used as leverage to pressure Saudi regime to reduce pressure on human rights activists and women human rights defenders. So I think this level of solidarity is needed, and uh, I see that you know human rights defenders themselves are active in Europe uh, to raise these issues. Uh, for example, to, to, tomorrow there is a protest in Copenhagen to support human rights defender in Bahrain, including women human rights defender. And this is actually in Copenhagen, it was in Brussels, uh, there was also in London. So there is global uh, solidarity network. And I think any kind of solidarity is needed today, especially pressure on parliamentarians in European uh, countries and on business, uh, private business, by the way. This is very important. And maybe one example to that, because recently we published at Frontline a report on the repression against labor rights defenders in Egypt, including women, labor human rights defenders. Uh, and we discovered the complicity of a French military, uh, French um, military industry, uh, a business called Naval Group. Uh, the French government own more than 60% in share in this company. The complicity between this company and the Egyptian military to repress labor rights defenders in Alexandria. So this is an area. Uh, litigation can be a, a, a possible way to file case against this company, raising the issue with the media. There are too many things to be done in, in Europe. Especially that this government depend on European uh, aid, European uh, military industry, and diplomacy, you know, to, to raise their profile, like Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia is very caring about his image and so on. Is there something in there? Yeah, I wanted to actually reaffirm what you said, Mataz, about the importance of holding our home governments accountable for their complicity in the rights violations that take place in the Middle East region, especially in providing unconditional support, let's say, for the Israeli occupation of Palestine, of providing arms assistance to their client states in the region. 
That is why I'm hopeful about the region, because I know we tend to essentialize the problems there. We tend to think that the region is fundamentally inhospitable to freedom and democracy, but no, there's, it's because of all the obstacles that are in the way. So once we remove them, once, let's say, the West gets out of the way and stop, stops kind of preventing that, natu that natural flow towards progress, then actually we will start to see a lot of positive change. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in, in, because uh, in my organization we work to help. It's a more humanitarian support now to people at risk, to human rights defenders at risk, to relocate internally or externally, to provide them with emergency support. This is the least that we can do. But I think when it comes to Syria, the problem right now is that the revolution and the uprising is is officially failed. And today, many countries are starting to normalize relations with Bashar al-Assad in the Arab region. They're starting to normalize relations with, with Bashar. So there is uh, a crisis in, in, in when it comes to Syria. So much more work needed on policy level. You know, humanitarian support is important. But when it comes to improving the situation, the overall situation, more advo advocacy is needed on, on policy on policy level because I think if the, if the international community agreed on the on the outcome of the Syrian uh, uh, protest and the, and the revolution and just agreed on the status quo right now, mainly because of the interference of Russia and and China, I mean things will not develop peacefully in the country and and it will, you know. There is a permanent state of disorder we will see in the Middle East. I don't believe that a new repressive regime in the way that we, know, we knew in 60 or 70 will be able to survive in the region anymore. More instability, more ISIS, more uh, recruit for, 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 for fighters, you know. In Egypt, there is a recent report uh, published by Human Rights First on how Egyptian prisons have become more and more uh, 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 that the recruit, recruitment in Egyptian prison has uh, increased because of the torture and because of the poor condition, uh, prison condition in the country. So I think stability is, is at stake and questionable, you know, by, by this regime. And this order will continue unless there is a change in, in policies in the region. Um, let me ask, we have not spoken at all about, I mean, I, although in one of the presentations somebody talked about cultural relativism, which is winning our way now. Um, we have not spoken about actually understanding the region in order to be able to use the understanding of the region to achieve human rights dividends. I mean, what do you think about that in relation to, I mean, in promoting human rights in the MENA regions to understand the dynamics of the region itself, you know? Now, we were talking earlier about, the, about Tunisia. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a lot of cross-regional interventions. Yes, I mean, um, the, 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 a bill has been passed by cabinet in relation to um, equal distribution of inheritance. It's going to parliament now to be voted upon. But you find out that, I mean, for example, Egypt, you find the Azhar scholars are challenging it. And they have a lot of influence in relation to, and other, other regional, you know, voices, strong voices are challenging that. So what impact will, I mean, does that sort of, I mean, cross country intervention, I mean, even if it is verbal, uh, relate to understanding the region in order to be able to really, I mean, have uh, positive achievements in human rights work. I will add another question to this. <laughs> yes. uh, I wonder after what happened uh, in Egypt, uh, if uh, al assad um, I mean, Egypt was a key country in the region, and they had a huge impact, uh, it is al assad but if uh, al assad has still this position, this power uh, to, you know, uh, have some impact on the other countries in the region with regard to uh, human rights and region, you know, the uh, religion and human rights. To that, to <laughs> <laughs> okay, many questions. I think the panelists have been very cautious and careful in pointing out the limits to exceptionalism. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which is really what uh, mm -hmm. affects, has affected a lot of studies, a lot of popular approaches to understanding many facets of life in the region, including uh, human rights. No, which is the topic of discussion today. Having 
delineated the limits to exceptionalism, we cannot deny that uh, specificity of the context is important. And I think this is the point you're making. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot pretend uh, social political phenomena operate in vacuum and are devoid of and completely independent of the context in which they interact with, uh, with, with the environment. And I think this is where understanding the specificities rather than the exceptionalities of the region mm -hmm. is important. I mean, the point about equality of inheritance is important because you can be sure no matter what progressive laws mm -hmm. will be put on, uh, in print on the table, given uh, the deep uh, roots, cultural, religious, uh, ideological roots of this old age mm -hmm. phenomena, it will take forever for Changes, such yeah. progressive rules to actually mm -hmm. manifest themselves in, in in reality, in practice. Because all it takes is within a family, if the bigger mm -hmm. brother doesn't exactly. approve of the latest progressive laws, they will take matters into their hands and divide things according to what they see as religiously right. There are, there are many examples, there are many reports of such practices on the ground, uh, rather than, you know, latest uh, enactments. That, that's, I think that the, this understanding the specificities and heeding the, the right balance between the specificity and the generality, this is, this is something that uh, is the challenge mm -hmm. of all of us. Uh, in area studies, and not just with the East, yeah. I mean, if you talk about human rights in Latin America, which was at some stage the uh, place where many of the juntas were exported to the rest of the world, the model, you would have to take into account the specificities in that context. But on the point of about optimism versus pessimism, um, to, for either of these, I think at the end of the day, we have to have some metrics for measuring progress or lack of it. Now, if I have understood correctly, the prevailing mood on the panel, at least two out of three, possibly two and a half out of three, is they point to the struggles that are ongoing, that mm -hmm. remind us of the struggle for human rights as being a process rather than a linear event, which is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But they come very close to actually treating the struggle for progress as the progress itself. The struggle for human rights is not the same thing as attaining, attaining it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The struggle against poverty is not the same as uh, eradicating poverty. Mm -hmm. I say this as an economist, but I'm an <laughs> <laughs> expert on human rights. Yeah. But I know a little bit about the Iran. You mentioned the yes. movement. Mm -hmm. yes. What happened to the Green Movement? Can I? Yeah, I, I would love to uh, address yeah, that. Yeah, I know, because I'm sure <laughs> going to uh -huh. the Green Movement. How many newspapers were closed after the Green Movement? Yes. What happened to the leaders? They were, it took the regime five seconds to put them under house arrest. Mm -hmm. You see a picture of one of them every maybe blue moon. That's a picture of them. A movement that brought out an estimated one and a half million into the streets of Tehran June, 2000, June, June 2009, it's about. Now, of course, it hasn't died. Of course, those ambitions, aspirations are very much alive. But look at the mass exodus of journalists who left mm -hmm. because the movement was set back with sheer force <coughs> on the streets of Tehran. They run over by cars, from the military cars, they crossed around the water. We should not underestimate the impunity with which the counter-revolutionaries would Helped. make sure they would lose no time in countering the struggle for human rights. And one last one, whether you're prepared to extend your optimism to the Indian <laughs> territory. We did mention, Definitely. Mm. And that's where I really despair. I mean, I'm not saying that the struggle for uh, Palestine is over. Of mm. course it's not. Of course it's not. It's the deepest, longest conflict of the region from last century. But where are we in terms of the most basic, the most elementary human rights in that part of the world, under the 
Sorry, yep. just, Thank you. I'd love to address a few of those points. First of all, this is, again, not to dismiss the sort of the people that were made martyrs um, in the Green Movement and the, the arrests and all of that. Yes, we, we accept that. However, um, and yeah, the Green Movement may have faded, but I see the reward of that sort of struggle being, let's say, the fact that the reformists came into power. They would not, we would not have had a two-term reformist president in Iran and a majority reformist parliament were it not for the struggle of the people. They came and they're in power because of that movement. So this is an example of a tangible reward beyond just the struggle or the, the lifting of the driving ban. All of these are actual rewards. So let's not forget those. Those are clear progress being made. Of course, they're also not perfect and we are still fighting for more, but it's a daily struggle and it's a daily sort of going back and forth. Um, the other point was, what was the other question that you? The, last one. the Palestine. Okay. Palestine. This is probably the most, I think, the most central question in the region. The Palestinian solidarity movement, um, unfortunately, the, the regimes across the region have abandoned that. They still pay lip service to it occasionally, but uh, there's increasing collusion with Israel um, following the lead of sort of the Western Israel first policy, and I think that is the greatest impediment to the end of the Palestinian occupation. However, there are other ways around it. I'm personally involved through my consultancy, and I'll take this opportunity to share with you a new campaign that I'm launching, which is to urge the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to officially open the investigation into Israeli war crimes in Gaza. This is an example of, you know, where the peace process is dead, we can turn to international institutions and instruments and the rule of law to provide some form of justice, even if it's to leave behind a record of what happened. Um, I think that that's the only hope forward. Of course, there's the BDS movement and, and many other sort of uh, peace movements that are supporting the Palestinian cause. However, it, it's the complicity of local governments who have let down their, uh, the Palestinian brethren. It is the, uh, our failure in the West to sort of push that cause in our parliaments, right here in the UK, the kind of responsibility, historical responsibility that, that the UK has um, through sort of the Balfour legacy and, and what they left behind in that part of the world. I mean, all of those are the roots of the problem. And I also don't feel that they are so much religious or cultural. And that is the sort of danger of essentializing that. They're political and historically created conflicts. And they can easily be resolved, um, not overnight, but with, um, you know, th that sort of careful optimism. Thank you. Yeah, um, okay, let me take Sorry. one. You want to comment on yes, that? Okay, go on. Go on. Yeah. Okay, and you are to, go on. Yeah. Go on. Mm -hmm. A few words on the issue of uh, political uh, or relativism and, uh, and religion. Just <laughs> there is a, a scene, a recent scene, President Sisi and Sharm sheikh in the Arab, uh, Europe Arab Summit, talking on relativism, defending relativism and attacking Europeans, saying you are not going to teach us humanity and so on. But at the same time, the president of Tunisia was in Human Rights Council in Geneva, defending equality inheritance from within the religion. Huh? Because the report... That from was, within the religion. Yes, yes because exactly. the report, because the report that was published uh, by Bushra al Haq Hamida, a woman human rights defender in Tunis, and this committee formed by President Sipsi himself. If you read the, the, the report, it's, 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 big, it's a long document, mm -hmm. it's on personal liberty, and it is a clear example of how, you know, scholars and activists use religion to defend progressive position on mm -hmm. uh, women, uh, on inheritance equality, on personal freedom, and you, using, you know, progressive interpretation of Islam. Salah al-Din Gorshi is a, a known uh, thinker and uh, Islamic thinker and scholar who was part of this committee, and he also add insight 
to to the report. So you know, it's it's part of the of the struggle today also. Yeah, exactly. I actually want to say this, that uh, in Tunisia, for instance, also in Morocco, mm -hmm. uh, they try actually uh, to start a debate uh, among the theologians and, you know, religious leaders about inheritance law. But uh, I agree with you that it is uh, uh, the legal uh, reforms uh, are uh, one thing and the practice is another thing. When I give you again the example from Tunisia, for instance, uh, these... Um, um, uh, law about uh, uh, being allowed to, uh, to marry a non-Muslim in practice is still not possible. You go there <laughs> and you come back with empty hands. And inheritance law is uh, also supported by the women who define themselves as feminist and secularist. When I, for instance, interviewed Bishra Hamidi uh, from Nidatonis, she told me uh, uh, for her, uh, the main challenge is actually to address these secularist and feminist uh, women because they say that is the social reality of country and if you touch this, uh, you know, the system will collapse. So even non-religious uh, people are supporting the system. So it is uh, the specificity of the uh, country is there and the realities are uh, much more different than legal reforms. And progress measuring, uh, I agree also uh, that uh, attaining the human rights is uh, something different than, uh, you know, uh, this struggle. But um, what uh, I, at least what I was saying is, I mean, these institutional reforms are important. Maybe we can uh, measure some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, of the uh, human rights uh, protection uh, uh, using this uh, establishment of institutions uh, or other uh, policies against human rights. But uh, I just uh, want to point actually this hope and struggle, not uh, it is only, you know, a, a rosary picture with, you know, struggling, but there are no human rights. Uh, in case of Egypt, I am more pessimistic than other countries, for instance, in Tunisia, because in Tunisia you see the struggles and the outcome of it, too. But in um, in, uh, in uh, Egypt now, for now, it's an endless struggle, actually. You don't know where it is going and how it's been in two or three years. Thank you. We'll take one more question and we run up. We have only five minutes more. Yes. <coughs> I'll, I'll be brief. My name is Logan. I graduated last year. I'm just going to be a uh, second um, So the migration issue, I think, is really important. And I'm wondering Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you take it in rounds, yes. but also use it as an opportunity to round up oh, your, great. I mean, done. I've personally witnessed a lot of progress actually being made on that front, specifically because of the international bad press and scrutiny that some Gulf states, for instance, were getting because of the poor treatment of the laborers. And they've since put into place wage protection schemes, better housing. I know that all seems insignificant. But it, it's actually tremendous because they also didn't need to do that. But they recognize the importance of at least appearing to be law-abiding and respecting international codes of conduct. Was that sort of your question? Yeah, my, my question is more about the reality of it because my understanding the reality doesn't really conform to those kind of standards. Um, so I guess my question is more about Well, I saw it with my own eyes where I was able to tour... Uh, the units where the laborers work, so rather than them being sardined into a room, they have a better kind of facilities. I mean, that is, uh, I would say, an improvement over the general worker conditions internationally. So it's not, again, to act as an apologist for, uh, for those kinds of um, ill practices, but it's, it's to give credit where credit is due. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, things can develop 
very quickly in the region. I think even Egypt, uh, while the situation now is very gloomy and, and it's very hard for activists to work, but, you know, anything can, can happen because of the fragility of socioeconomic situation. 100, you know, it's 100 million uh, population. Uh. It's not easy, really, to, to maintain and stabilize a repressive regime in this complex demographic young uh, society. In 2010, we didn't expect at all <laughs> what happened in 2011. And in 2012, I didn't expect also what happened in 2013 in Egypt. And today, we see what's happening in Algeria and Sudan, and it also was beyond any expectation. So it's very hard to predict, but we have dynamics that is ongoing and rapidly uh, changing. And the struggle for human rights and democracy is very long in many countries. It was long in Europe, it was long in Latin America, and it's, 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 it's up and down, and revolution is, is not simple, you know, and counter-revolutionary is not the end also. Thank you. Malek. Uh, uh, the uh, last year's panel, I concluded with a um, sentence from uh, Moshef Mazruki, the ex-president of Tunisia, and I would like to <laughs> make the same because uh, he uh, said, uh, we, um, are st uh, st we are still struggling, and uh, we lost uh, lots of battles, but we will, uh, won, uh, we will win the uh, war. So. Thank you so much. There's another event coming up, so we just need to round up. Okay. Thank you so much, I mean, for everyone coming, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this evening. Please, let's give the panelists a round of applause.